It's so special for me to be here. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but that little Chinese girl is my daughter. Um, I don't know, it's just so fun to be teaching after my daughter leads worship. I, I, those who are parents, you know what I'm going through. It's like, wow, this is crazy. She looks so old. She's, you know, I, I just remember when I brought her home, she's a little bloody, ugh. you know, and, and now to see her up there, and I don't know if this embarrasses you. I don't know if you're too old. Am I embarrassing you? Okay. What if I do this? <laughs> no? It's good? Okay. Um... <laughs> Uh, a lot of you guys are here for a preview day. Welcome. And um, I just want to let you know, man, my Bible college years and my seminary years uh, were absolutely the, the worst years of my life. <laughs> um, they were, yes. Um, but it didn't have to be that way, okay? And that's what I want to talk about. Uh, I, I'm not joking. They really were the worst years of my life. And if I could go back and relive those two years in Bible college and three years, and so, I mean, if I could relive a five-year period, that would be it. Um, my life became a mess during that time. And, but like I said, it didn't have to be that way because things were happening to me that I was unaware of. And I'm almost on this vendetta to help other Bible college students and seminary students get the most of their education because so much of that is necessary, but to avoid some of the things that I went through because things happened to me that I didn't realize were happening at the time. I didn't think about it. I just got, I got so myopic in my perspective. Like I just saw this one thing in front of me and I missed so much. I, I, I wrote down some thoughts the other day of what, what was it that happened to me. One was I, I neglected, uh, I completely ne neglected those who were in poverty. That just isn't a thought. I, I didn't think that way. I, I know this generation is more thoughtful of that, but at that time, I completely neglected those who were in poverty. Church, my church became secondary. Hell lost its urgency. I became weird socially, <laughs> and my prayers became ordinary. And these were the things as I was trying to think, okay, what, what, what jumps out? Um, what, what happened to me during that time? And uh, again, I, it doesn't have to be this way. And I, as I thought, what, what could have helped me during that time? And I think the biggest thing I could think of is you need to learn to pull your head out of your school, okay? You, you, you need to, uh, I'm saying focus, like don't waste this time. Like this is, this is serious training, preparation, like devote yourself to it, but you gotta learn to stick your head out of this place every once in a while and look around and look beyond your immediate situation and start looking at things globally. And then at times even taking your eyes off of what's happening globally and to look eternally. The Bible talks about this, about how we can get so focused and so nearsighted that we are blind rather than really looking at what's going on in the world and looking even beyond that to what's unseen. Um, otherwise, you're going to start to uh, develop some habits and patterns in your life that aren't healthy, that are hard to pull out of. Um, and you'll also end up over-dramatizing your own issues. I hear some chuckles here about uh, roommates. Um, but in uh, <laughs> 2, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 17 says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And later on in chapter 5, he talks about how we as believers, we walk by faith and not by sight. 
Two weeks ago, I was over at Stanford University, and um, I went to, a, this is so cool, a friend invited me to their visual reality department. Uh, you guys don't have visual reality, okay. Visual reality department, I mean, so, so, so what it is, you, you walk into this room, there was like 10 of us, and we walk into this room, you know, not, not quite this big, but he put like the, these goggles on me. Now, when he put these goggles on, everything looked the same in the room. Everything looked exactly the same, so, you know, I'm looking around. I don't see the people anymore. I still hear the guy next to me explaining me what to do, but I'm just looking, and the room looks normal. Everything looks the same, except there's a board in front of me, like a plank, and the voice says, go ahead and walk on to the edge of the plank, and so I, I just step on the edge, and then suddenly, the ground falls down around me, and my plank, this, this thing just starts taking me through the roof, and now I'm 100 feet like over the building, and I'm looking down at Stanford University, and he's going, take a step. And man, my heart is pounding, because I'm just like trying to balance on this piece of wood. And, uh, and, 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 and so I, I, I take a, you know, the slight step, and, and, and then he goes, go ahead and walk to the edge. Go walk all the way to the end of the plank. And I'm just thinking, I can't do it. You know, my head, because, man, it is terrifying. There's noises, there's sounds, everything's going on. They have speakers everywhere. I mean, you really felt like you were just 100, 200 feet up in the air. But he says, walk to the edge. And the only thing that made me go was I thought, wait a second, I just saw a 10-year-old girl do this. You know, and... <laughs> This is so embarrassing. And so I just start walking, you know, and I'm doing this. You know, and everyone's watching me. I'm in a room, you know, like on the ground, but I, in my head, because I'm looking through these goggles, I'm just, I'm, I'm balancing, I'm looking, you know, whatever. And, and, and I find out later that one out of three people won't even take that first step. Like it's that real to them. And two out of three, because then you get to the end, and he goes, go ahead and jump off. <laughs> and he says, two out of three people won't do it. And, you know, so I take one step and you, you just hear the noise, like, you know, like, you know, and you just kind of start falling. And none of it was, re but in my head, it's crazy. Like I had to play these mind games going, this isn't real. This isn't real. I can do this. You know, I, I'm still in that same place. I, I, I can do this. I can make this happen. People are watching. I better make it happen. You know, it's just all of this stuff. Like, I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to fall. And, I, and, and, and in my mind, I'm going, I'm going to take these glasses off in a few seconds. And I'm going to see all the people again that were watching. And it just made me realize, you know, we really have to have that perspective of life right now is the Bible says, don't look at what you can see. This is all transient. Any moment, we're going to take these goggles off. And we're going to realize that there was this great cloud of witnesses watching us. And this voice that was guiding us to go, man, you, you don't have to stay on that little piece of wood. You, you can step out of the boat. There's a, there's a bigger reality going on than what you see right now. That's why the Bible says you can live by faith and not by sight. It's like, no, you can actually jump into that pit of fire, you know, and it won't burn you. You can actually walk in that den of, I know it looks like it's just lions here. It's like what Elisha said to a servant. God, open his eyes so we can see there's other things going on. Okay, and any moment, any moment for us, it's going to be time to take off those goggles and see our Savior and see all those who have gone before us. And hear them say, well done, but right now they're looking on. They're looking on as we're afraid to make decisions. And they're going, look at him, he's scared. As though you're not watching. As though you're not really in control. As though he can't really step out of that boat. That's what this book is about. It's about people who believed and said, I'll take those steps of faith. Man, and so right now what I'm saying is, as you study, as you prepare, also make sure... You look around, because there's things going on in this world that we need to be aware of. And, uh, and not only that, but stop just looking to what you can see right in front of you. Right now, my Savior is looking at me. Like Jesus is watching me right now. I have to remind myself of that. 
to go, this is not about pleasing you or giving you a sermon that you're going to amen or clap for me afterwards or help my reputation. Right now, I have to look beyond that. I got to look outside of these goggles and go, okay, God, you're watching me right now. Am I giving you the honor you deserve? And I'm making sure people understand that this is not about us in this short time here on earth, and this is all about you. Am I in any way trying to bring glory to myself, or am I just deflecting that all and helping them understand there's a holy God up there right now who's watching, who's determining whether we walk out of this room, who's giving us one more breath, one more thought in our mind and allowing everything to work, and it's all about him, all about him. And yet somehow, we can develop habits right now where we forget all about that and just live for the here and now, and we focus on what's seen. And if the Bible says, we are not to look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal, transient. Everything you see is transient. When you look in the mirror, That's transient. You're not going to look like that in 20 years, okay? (laughs) Look at your dad. You know, it's just, it it switches. It's like, that's here right now, but you know what? It's going to be gone. So remember that. I I, want to go back a little bit and just kind of explain some of the statements I made earlier about when I said, you know, I um, neglected those in poverty. Um, I don't know, somehow we can just get into our studies and get into the words and forget there's real people out there that are really struggling. Um, Last year about this time, um, my wife and I went to Africa and I wanna show a a picture of of one of the kids we met there. Um, It was pretty devastating, you know, so while we're here studying the word of God, I mean, there are people that are just trying to survive. I, I went with my buddy, Pat, and what he does is he, he finds the people that are gonna die you know, within days, maybe weeks, and it's like, let's get to them first and get them going. We measure their arms, make sure they really are starving before we feed them. Uh, she clearly was. You know what was awesome, though? I got a picture, this totally out of the blue, like two months ago, um, of the same girl. But we were able to, isn't that crazy? And go ahead and put the, yeah. Go ahead and do the next slide. I mean, in 10 months. That was just crazy to me. Like, because he told me, I don't know if we're going to be able to save this one, you know, different ones, because they're so bad. The stomach's distended, which means they're, they're eating their insides. And, it, you know, so when I saw that picture, I'm like, no way. She may go ahead. That's the last, last shot. So that's, that's her today. And... I mean, like, I I can't tell you, like, what a rush it is to think, I had a piece of that. Like, like, what makes my soul more valuable than hers? Why is my soul and my life so important that we can just pour so much money, so much attention into me when someone's just looking for a meal, you know, and mom's watching each kid one at a time just dwindling away, like, like I, we've got to understand there are things going on, and when we get that perspective, it really changes the problems that, that, that occur on campus. You start realizing, yeah, this really isn't that big of a deal, and I need to learn to just get over it for their sake. And then, you know, we'll read passages like Matthew 25, you know, about the sheep and goat judgment. And it gets old because, oh, I've heard that passage. Really, you're going to preach Matthew 25? How many times? Have... No, but you... that was, those are the words of Jesus on judgment day saying, I was hungry and you fed me. Like, it changes the urgency when I go, that's Jesus. That little girl I met a year ago was Jesus. Okay, I know it's a little bit more trendy and acceptable to care for the poor, and so you hear these things all the time, but somehow that can, it loses its gravity, its weight, and you realize, man, that was Jesus. That was Jesus. Man, I fed Jesus. Jesus was twinning a little weight of nothing, and I had a piece of uh, feeding him. This is insane. And then you start realizing, man, but he's everywhere, and I've got to get to all of them, and that sense of urgency can be lost, and I'm just begging you, 
Please, I'm not saying just take off, study, get ready, because you'll be more useful for the kingdom if you do. But don't just get so lost in your studies that you don't peek around and look around and remember them and do what you can even during this training period because if you don't, you'll set patterns. And pretty soon you'll just set yourself up and your cute little family up because you're just used to this pattern that you've set here of ignoring what's going on around the world and focusing on yourself. I said the church, my church became secondary and that's, that's a serious issue in uh, Bible college um, because a lot of you come here and you come to chapel a couple times a week and you hear some good messages. I mean, not to brag, but we're pretty good. Um, you, you know, just the, the people that they bring in, it's like, okay, let's bring in the best communicators to, to speak to our students. And so then you, then you go to your church service on Sunday and you go, why am I even here? Because we've reduced church to a service. And our understanding of that word church is, oh, a, a sermon and maybe a couple of songs. And you guys, that is not what I see in this book. Christ was dependent on the church. It, 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 was, it was through the church that he was gonna reach the world. He was gonna build his church and the gates of hell were not gonna stand against it. And the idea of the church, you know, the Bible explains is that each of us, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, each of us is given a spiritual gift for the common good. Like you, you and I are given something supernatural. Like, like not just an average gift, but like the Holy Spirit of God, the creator himself dwells in me and manifests himself through me as I exercise this gift. But this gift is for the common good. It was meant to be for the body in that passage that the Bible teaches. In 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, it's, it's about the church it's about the church body and its members. And, and Jesus' prayer was, I, I want them to be one. And, and, and Peter talks about how it's, it's the church that before you weren't this people group, but now you are this people group. And you come under the leadership of the elders and this foundation that was built on the prophets and the apostles. But somehow in this setting, we can kind of just go, okay, I did the church thing in chapel. No, you didn't. That's not the church thing God's desire was that we would become this family, that these churches would be so together. I mean, he really tests my faith with some of his statements in John 17 when he says, look, I and them, you, you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. And he prays, he goes, Father, just like you and I are one, imagine Jesus and the Father being one. I mean, that's really one. He goes, that's what I'm praying for the church. That's what I'm praying for these believers. I want them to be one like we are one. When you go to your church, is that your prayer? When you get, get with your church folks, you go, God, I want to be so close to these people, as close as you are to your son. That's how I want to be with this group of people because that's your desire. And you say, what, first of all, that that can happen. But secondly, he says, when that happens, then the world's going to believe that I was sent from you. And then the world's going to believe that these people are actually loved by you. See, that, that doesn't make logical sense. That mathematically doesn't make, that's not a good equation in my mind. I just go, why would me being one with a group of people cause the world to believe that Jesus was the son of God and that I am loved by God? It doesn't make logical sense. That's where you go by faith and go, you know what, Jesus said it. Jesus prayed it. Somehow, that oneness in the church body was going to be the apologetic that would show the world that we were loved by God and that Jesus really is the Messiah. I know I wouldn't have come up with that, but that's where we go, well, it's in Scripture. That's what Jesus said, and so I'm going to go for it. I'm going to pursue this oneness with those whom I call my church. We've got to change our understanding of church. Okay, think gang, not movie. Okay? Church has become more like a movie, something you attend, and oh, I went to a movie today. You know, I already saw a good movie. I, I attended that. No, think gang, 
this group of people that you're just family with 24-7. They got your back. You, got, you don't go, oh, I went to gang. How was gang? You know, it's just, <laughs> this is, th- these, are my, these are my people. Man, they're one. We're one. We've got each other's backs. And I didn't take that seriously during my time here. I let chapel become my church. I let the dorm become my, my family. And it's like, no, you know what? It's, it's bigger than that. And we've got to learn to be integral parts of the church, using our giftings during this time. Otherwise, you're going to set a pattern. And then, you know, you got all sorts of people now that say, oh, I love God. I just hate the church. That doesn't even make sense. Okay? That just goes against everything Jesus taught, that we were supposed to be one with them. Hell lost its urgency. Man, it's, when I went to Bible college, it was my first time in a Christian environment. You know, I was public school, grew up in, in Stockton, went to Lincoln High School. Um, no cheers. Okay, I thought maybe there was someone. Uh, Delta Junior College. Yeah, seriously, all right, there you go. Go Mustangs or whatever we were. Um, but uh, man, I just remember, gosh, I'm the guy that would just cut class to tell people about Jesus because it was so real to me. I started walking down the locker halls, looking at all my friends, thinking they're, these guys are going to hell. I got to do something. I mean, I, I literally, literally would just get in conversations and just, it wasn't my break, but it was their break. So I was like, forget class. This is bigger. Um, you can do that if you're Asian. And I... Uh, <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do, get a B? So, uh, but for me, it was like, I just remember, man, this is what I care about. This is what I, that's when I started ministry. People go, oh, how do you receive your call to ministry? I go, man, I just walked around my high school campus after becoming a believer, and I couldn't stand look at my friends and thinking that they could spend eternity apart from God. And, and, and let me just, Time out real quick. You know, I know it's real popular to not believe in God's judgment anymore and how could a loving God, you know, punish. But man, read this. You guys are studying this book. Just read it. You know, I mean, you don't have to get very far before he drowns everyone. Okay? (laughs) What's that, six pages in? And I, I don't mean to make light of it, but it's like, Man, people that say, oh, how could a loving God? I'm going, how could a loving God literally drown everyone on the earth? How could a loving God say to the Egyptians, I'm going to kill the firstborn of everyone. Yet that first beloved child, I'm going to kill every single one of them. And the wailing that took place in that. And on and on and on you go, oh, yeah, well, well, but you're, you're quoting Old Testament. Yeah, because he mellows out in Revelation. <laughs> it, you guys, I, I, it's, it's this urgency of going, man, the, the, you know, by Revelation, it's like, man, I'm, I'm going to throw anyone whose name is not written in the book of life into this lake of fire. See, I thought about this all through high school. Man, in, in college, I remember this. I remember taking philosophy class just so that I could talk to the whole class. I remember taking speech classes just so that I could give speeches to my whole class. Because I'm just thinking, I got to say something. I got to say something. I got to say something. Man, this can't happen. I remember just with tears, you know, coming home from work, you know, waiting to tables and just crying oh god you can't let this happen i love these guys i love these guys and then i came in a christian environment and then well, all my friends are christians now and we just do intramural stuff and hang out with each other you just lose it and it's very hard to get back and so i encourage you in any way to pull your head out of this school maybe get a part-time job Maybe take a class at the city college or just do something to just revive that in you. And maybe for some of you, you've never had it. And pray for that. Pray for that heart like Paul's in in Romans 9 where he says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, 
my kinsmen according to the flesh. He just says, man, I'm just sick. I just have, I don't just shed a tear. I have like this great sorrow and unceasing anguish. I had that. I had that in high school. I had that in junior college. I lost it in Bible college. It didn't have to be that way. And in the summers, I'd get it back because I'd work a part-time job somewhere and fall in love with the people I was working with. I neglected those in poverty. Church became secondary. Hell lost its urgency. I became weird socially. I don't know. I don't know if there's any way we can get around that one. Um, I'm serious. I've been to... Christian high schools, Christian colleges, seminaries, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. It's just, it's just when we, we just start talking about stuff and, um, you know, when we get all dramatic about things that really the world doesn't care about um, and we miss the bigger issues and we just start talking amongst ourselves and that's my big concern that I don't hear a whole lot about is guys graduating from Bible college and seminary that have no clue how to talk to their next door neighbor. In fact, they, maybe they used to, but they lost it while they were here. And so then you have these pastors preaching sermons that the people are kind of nodding their heads and going, okay, you have no clue what my life is about, but that's, that's nice. Um, rather than guys that are out there and understand and understand the objections and why people aren't attracted to what we believe in. Paul says to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. You know, I, that, that was his goal. I, I went out there and I, I mingled with them. I figured out what my neighbor would actually get into and, and, and why, why? Because I was into it? No, I'm not into what he's into, but I would do it in order to win him to the Lord. And it's like, man, are we doing that? Because once we get out of practice again, we can lose it and then it just starts this whole lifestyle of being secluded to having no unbelieving friends. And I'm already out of time. I didn't even get to my main point, which is my prayer life, which became ordinary. But I'll do that some other time. If invite me back, and I'll do that one. It's, it's a good talk. Um, but uh, it's just, man, so much I wanted to say. I don't even know what I got across. But uh, um, no, you guys need to go to class. Um, we'll have the Asians stay back. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, just kidding. Uh, there's so much I want to say, but you know what? I, I really deeply believe in prayer. I really do. All right now, just, just close your eyes with me, and let's just take the goggles off, okay? Don't think of anything that's seen, okay? Forget about me, whatever else. What is unseen in this room? Father, it's you, you watching from heaven in all of your glory and all of your angels just gone, holy, 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 all the saints that have gone before us and suffered by, by being your witnesses and they lived by faith, they did crazy things and they're looking on upon us right now. They've already set the bar. They've set the pace. God, help us to see that cloud of witnesses. Help us to see that we can look beyond what we can see. And you want us to, to live by faith, not by sight. To look at people and to look at their souls. Not just their faces and their appearance, but their souls. The eternality of that. The seriousness of this. God, I, I, I pray for some of these, these uh, potential students, Lord. If this is the place where it will take them into greater use for your kingdom than bring them here. But Lord, I know I agree with, with uh, President Jackson and, and all of the board that Lord, if this is not what is gonna lead them to kingdom fruitfulness, then please, Lord, send them somewhere else. God, we are about your kingdom and seeking that first. We don't wanna waste our lives. We wanna see your face when the goggles come off and hear you say, well done. You didn't stare at that world. You, you, you were in it, but you were not of it. You kept your eyes over that world, and you looked at me, and we stared at you every day of our lives. Help us, Lord, to walk by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.